Good morning, St. James, and welcome to our Bible readings and our sermon for this Sunday. Um, I'm going to start off by reading our two Bible readings. Our first reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2 and verses 13 to 21. Uh, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Peter wrote this. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honour those who do right. It is God's will that your honourable life should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're being beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 20, verses 20 to 26. Watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus saw through their trickery and said, show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title is stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and they became silent. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's pray and ask for God's help in Uh, hearing his voice, understanding his word. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to guide us into your truth. Fill us again and enable us to hear your voice wherever we are right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we've been looking at uh, Peter's letter, the letter of 1 Peter, Uh, which was written to uh, Christians who'd been spread uh, throughout the Roman Empire, Christians who'd been uh, fleeing persecution, because Christianity was not a religion at this point. It was a a Jewish sect that allowed in Gentiles to meet with them, um, and they were seen as as a cult. They were seen as a a dangerous group that uh, that was causing trouble. And and what we've done is we've looked through at how... uh, Peter is encouraging encouraging them to see themselves as different, encouraging them to see themselves as citizens of heaven, as aliens, as people who don't belong in the cities they live in, but people who belong to God, whose uh, final dwelling, whose destination is heaven, and so who need to live alongside the people that they they meet, the people they in their neighbourhoods. Uh, but remembering their identity as children of God, um, first and foremost, ahead of nationality, ahead of culture, ahead of gender. They are God's children. That's the important thing. So um, in today's readings, uh, we have something about what's it mean to live in a strange place uh, under the rules of that place. Now, Um, If you've heard me speaking before, uh, you'll know that as a child, uh, 
my catchphrase was, that's not fair. And uh, my father would always reply, life isn't fair. And um, he reminds me of it uh, whenever uh, things are difficult or tricky. And it is, it, as children, we are very exercised about whether things are fair or not, whether we're being treated justly. And actually that goes on into adult, adulthood in terms of how we're treated by our employers, how we're treated by the council, um, and certainly um, how we are treated by the authorities is a big deal. So this time last year, um, with the Black Lives Matters protests going on, we listened to the stories uh, of black members of St James talking about how they are how they were treated um, by colleagues, how they were treated by people they worked for, um, and the difference it made to them being black in the, the way that they were treated. And there was a lot we heard that that was unfair. People being treated differently simply because they look different for no other reason than that. And it's an interesting dynamic if you are living in a country which is not the country you were born, that affects what your expectations are of how you're going to be treated. Um, certainly, um, Ali and I spent a year living in Jordan, um, next to, to Israel in the Middle East, and we were very conscious that it was not our country, that we didn't know how things worked. And there are a number of times when um, we felt unfairly treated. Certainly, if we went somewhere with our our Jordanian friends, they wouldn't they wouldn't send us to pay for things because we would be charged a higher price. Because the assumption of all the merchants and the the restaurant owners were that if you were from the West, then you had more money and you could afford to pay a higher price. So they would go and organise the bill and they would be charged less and we would split it between us. Now, at St James, uh, we have the delight and joy that is the UK's visa system. And we've had a number of people we've supported here where their visa has been cancelled or their visa has been in, uh, in an in-tray somewhere with the UK border agency for however long uh, and their, though that person's movements have been restricted because these things take time and it seems to take a, a, an awfully long time uh, as our government has uh, created a hostile environment for those who, uh, who they, they don't want to stay. And so there has been that conversation about what is fair, about what is just, uh, about how our country wants to be seen and perceived by others around the world, about what our commitments are to taking in those from other countries, uh, what responsibilities we have to people who've grown up in, in Commonwealth countries. But for whatever reason, it is. It can be difficult living in a country which is not your own. Now, in Peter's letter, the challenge is that none of us are in the country uh, of our birth. We've been adopted into God's kingdom. We are heirs with Jesus uh, of a heavenly kingdom. And so that's where we belong not here on earth. And so that affects how we're treated. <laughs> it affects how we're seen. It affects what our priorities are. And actually, if people believe that our priorities are different to theirs, there is a suspicion and there is a, a different type of treatment that goes with that. Now, we see an example of that in our, our second, our gospel reading, where Jesus is... Um, singled out they are trying to trap him into saying something 
that can then be used against him uh, and can be used as justification for the Roman governor arresting him. And so the, he's then asked, so, you know, we are God's people, this is God's country, uh, and yet we're asked to pay taxes to Caesar, the king of an, another country. Is that appropriate? Jesus, should we pay our taxes? And what they're looking for is for Jesus either to say, yes, you should pay taxes. So they can say, ah, so you don't believe that uh, this is God's kingdom at all. You're happy being uh, a lapdog for the Romans. Or maybe Jesus would say, no, we shouldn't pay taxes to the Romans, at which point they can say, fantastic, tell the Roman governor, have Jesus arrested for preaching insurrection and uh, treason against the Roman Empire. But Jesus, as we see, is too wise for that trap. And so Jesus asks them to show him a coin. And they show the coin. He says, well, whose face is on it? Whose image is there on that coin? They go, well, it's Caesar's. So, excellent. Give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. But give to God what belongs to God. Well, what belongs to God? Well, if you are Jewish, you believe that God made men and women in his image. You and I bear the image of God. And so Jesus is saying, give to God what belongs to God. Give yourself, your spirit, your allegiance, your, your whole being to God. And let Caesar keep the money. Why is that important? And so these people who've come and tried to trick Jesus are just goldfishing. And then they go away quiet and they leave him be. So Jesus has this answer which is saying, yeah, we live under Caesar's oppression. We have Roman soldiers in this country. But the important thing is, where is your heart and your soul? Who are you worshipping? Who, who do you belong to? And you are stamped with God's image. Therefore, you belong to God. Now, Peter looks at that in more detail. Peter talks to people uh, who are in a range of different countries, a range of different situations, talking about what it is to be under human authority. And so uh, he says to them, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king is head of state or the officials he has appointed. So you have this sense from the beginning of, Peter saying, I know the place you are in is not friendly. I know there are people who are in authority over you who do not share your faith, who do not understand the gospel that you believe, who do not understand the God whose spirit is in you. But even so, obey them. Keep the rules. Do what you are asked to do. And he goes further, he says, if you're a slave, well, then obey your master. Do what you are asked to do. As long as, um, here we go, uh, do what they tell you. Not only if they're kind and reasonable, but even if they're cruel. Now, this is, this is a really difficult one uh, for us today. Because, again, well, we're not called to be doormats. We shouldn't just take abuse. Um, and I think there is... There's an important distinction. Um, Peter is saying to people, if you're going to get into trouble for following Jesus, that's fine. But don't get into trouble for rebelling against your master or for, um, or for defending yourself. Let God defend you. And actually we know in that first century in the early church, there were so many Christians who were persecuted to death, who were martyred. And actually in this last century, there have still been many, many people martyred for their faith. Not in this country, but around the world. And, well, our faith is, as appalling as that is, and as heartbreaking as it is, those people are now with Jesus. Jesus. And the book of Revelation tells us that if you are martyred for your faith, you are honoured in heaven. You, are, you have a crown to wear 
to mark that you have suffered for Jesus' sake. And Peter says, that's fine. They can kill your body. Who cares? You belong to God. That is what's important. Now, there are those who are part of St. James Church who have been fighting unjust situations at work. And, and there's an important distinction here because there's one thing standing up for yourself and saying, I don't think this is fair. Through the Bible, the greater calling is to speak up for those uh, other people who are suffering. And those people who fought uh, through unions, through uh, seeing health and safety policies applied, through simply calling out uh, where someone in authority, where they work, is bullying others. They are protecting others. They're actually seeking to bring God's kingdom into the place that they work. But while they've done that, they've done it with respect and they've done it whilst following all the rules laid on them by their organisation. They've continued to uh, carry out their tasks, do their work. They haven't downed tools. They haven't said, no, no, I am, I am free from your authority because I serve a higher power. They've carried on within that organisation, but uh, pushed for change and pushed for others uh, to be free of oppression and free from, well, from, from bullying and uh, unjust treatment. I think often, even as Christians, we are so quick to defend ourselves. We're so quick to speak up when we think that we have been unfairly treated. Yet our example, uh, Peter says it at the end of this passage, God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example and you must follow in his steps. So that's not to say that we need to look to be suffering, we need to beat ourselves up or, or you know, overtly wear hair shirts or put ashes on our heads. But we are loving to everyone. And we sacrifice our good for the good of others. Because that's what Jesus did. And we know that Jesus stood before people unjustly accused and he said nothing. He took it. He accepted it. Now, again, there are people at St. James who are suffering injustice, whether because of the colour of their skin uh, or whether it's because of uh, disability whether it's because of their gender, their sexuality. Uh, when the church works well, whatever it is you are suffering, you shouldn't be fighting on your own. You shouldn't be the only person having to speak up for that. So where you are suffering, where you are being oppressed, it's the role of the church to stand with you and to speak up for you. Now, personally, I will confess that as I look around the society we're in, there is so much injustice and so much oppression, it can be hard to know where to start. But actually, I think that, again, Peter tells us what to do. Uh, he says, let me just find it in our passage, uh, Respect everyone and love the family of believers. You are part of a church, a family of believers. And in that family, there are people who are oppressed, who are suffering unfairly. So my suggestion is that we look to find out where other people are suffering unfairly. And then we go, to, we go into battle on their behalf. So where we are unfairly oppressed, we follow Jesus' example. And we continue just to do the best we can in that situation. But where we see others 
who are suffering simply because they are black or because they are gay or because they are disabled or because they are female, um, whatever it is. That's our place to say this is not okay. This is not acceptable. This breaks the laws of this country, the authority we've been placed under where there are uh, equal opportunities legislations, there is uh, a Disabilities Equalities Act, uh, I don't think it was Disability Discrimination Act, I would have to, my brain's going a little bit squiffy because I haven't written it down, sorry, um, where racial justice continues to be such an issue where people are treated badly, whether they are uh, Caribbean, African, um, South Asian, East Asian, any people group around the world tends to be unpleasant to those who are different, wherever you are. I, again, my example, the, the time I've lived in a country that, where I wasn't the majority was in Jordan. Uh, I, ca I cannot say I suffer discrimination, but I remember hearing if there was a a difficult job or a dirty job or a, a menial job, the p p people in Jordan, several of them, would say, "Oh, you get an Egyptian to do that," because there was there were many people who came from Egypt to Jordan to get work and to send money home to their families. And so it became this cliche, I'll oh, get an Egyptian to do it. And they discriminated against Egyptians because it was like, oh, they're the people who do the, the rubbishy jobs. Every country have that has those that they consider to be lower than them. I'm struggling, but I'm better than them. As a church, we are called to be different. We're called to be better than that because none of us fit in. None of us. For none of us, this is our country. This is where we live. It's where we are now. But it's not our ultimate home. It's not where we're going to be. So we serve our masters. We do our jobs as best we can. But we serve God first and foremost. We put him first. And so where we are oppressed... Jesus' example is we take it, but as a vicar of this church, I would then say, don't suffer in silence. Tell your brothers and sisters, tell people in church and let us stand with you. Let other people write to uh, their MP to, um, to come with you uh, as... Um, you know, a third person as a, wit as a witness uh, if you have to meet your, your line manager at work. Let people know if you're going to stand up for a particular issue on Twitter or on social media. And again, we do these things together. This is not our home, but we are called to respect the authority that is in this place and to not give anyone a reason for saying oh no that, that that those people they just cause trouble they don't they don't engage they're not we don't really understand what what's going on with them we're called to do our jobs to the best of our ability as if it's for god and if we suffer for no reason then we let god make that right Although sometimes I think God will inspire our brothers and sisters at church to stand and fight alongside us. Kids Church, have been talking about the armour of God. Um, and it's always fun to be able to get out my sword. And um, But I think sometimes we think that the whole point of the armour of God is to defend ourselves. Against the enemy, against the devil, yes. But in this world that we're in, we're here to protect each other. We stand with each other. We stand together. We love and support our brothers and sisters 
and we fight for them. And we look for our brothers and sisters to fight for us. So look around you. If you don't know anyone at St James who is struggling, who is uh, unfairly treated, ask around. Talk to people, ask what's going on at work, ask what's going on um, in different areas of their lives. Find out. And then you can pray, then you can support, then you can show that love. Which means that we can just accept when we're treated unfairly, knowing that God has our back and our church family has our back. The aim is not that we have the perfect lives here on earth. The aim is that we live our lives made in the image of God, honouring Jesus with what we do, so that when we come into our heavenly home, our Lord and Master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, I'm going to pray, ask for God to be with us, to help us, uh, and I just yeah, encourage you to reach out to other people at St James, find out about what's going on with them, let them know what's happening with you, so that we can do all this together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that this is not our home. Our ultimate home is with you. We ask for your grace to continue doing our best at work and in our communities, even when we are treated unfairly, when we're treated badly. Help us, Lord Jesus, to follow your example in putting other people first and not being so quick to defend or justify ourselves. And as your people here, your family, would you help us to stand with each other to defend our brothers and sisters from any prejudice or oppression they are suffering. That we might be your instrument in supporting and blessing those who are who are oppressed, who are facing the rough side of prejudice, the rough side of living somewhere that is not ultimately our home. Fill us, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit and lead us in the weeks to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for watching or for listening. Um, huge thanks to Reverend Amelia, who is uh, leading communion at St. James today, uh, which enables me uh, to be somewhere else in a tent, probably in the rain. Um, I, oh, yeah, enjoy uh, the week to come. Stay safe uh, and we will see, beat you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.